Hi, welcome back to Walking in the Word with uh, Chaplain Greg. I am Chaplain Greg, your guide through this, and I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, if you like this video series, please like this video and subscribe to my channel, and that will help others be able to uh, get interested in the Word of God. So, we've uh, gone through the first two chapters of Genesis. This is our uh, third week, uh, and we're going to be covering chapter three. And uh, after this, we're going to start taking off and take a little bit bigger, more expansive view. We won't be getting as in-depth into Bible study as we have for the past few weeks. But uh, this week, we're going to be looking at chapter three in depth. So just to recap, God has made creation out of chaos. God has made a special creation of the human, which carries God in, God's image. The human was equal parts male and female. God put the humans into his special garden, the garden in Eden, not the garden of Eden, but the garden in Eden. Their job was to give identities to all of the creatures in the creation and to expand the garden. Now, there are two trees that are mentioned. The tree of life, which is the life-sustaining presence of God. And then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the humans are told that if they eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they are telling God that they know better than him what is right and what is wrong. All right? God is saying, don't eat from that. That is your only command. You know, it's your only thing that you can eat. That's the only thing you can't do. Because if you eat that, you will die. Now, death isn't really a concept that they need to worry about, right? They're in the presence of God. They're in the life-sustaining presence of God. If they eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they're saying, well, God, you know what? I think I'm going to do it my way. You said not to do this, but I think it's better that I do this. This, in, this action of eating of the, the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil symbolizes rebellion. And the action introduces death into their ex existence. As a part of having God's image the humans have the free will to choose this moral choice. They follow God or they follow their own desires and what seems right to their eyes. Chapter 3, we're introduced to a new character, the snake. The snake is symbolic of the host Satan or the adversary, the accuser, the prosecutor. The snake is all throughout scripture. And I like to use the term snaky. Like um, Saul, when we get to uh, when we get to Samuel's books, Saul becomes a very snaky creature. Um, Pharaoh, very snaky creature. The snake, the Leviathan, the dragon, all of these images are images that reflect the adversary. And here are the lies that the snake tells to the woman part of human. Now the man is there with her, but he's going after the woman, the source of life. Remember Eve, she isn't given her name Eve yet. She's just called the woman, but she is the source of human life. God provides life to the humans and it's through the woman that life continues. So he goes after her and he tells her three lies. The first lie he tells her, well, God didn't really tell you to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't really tell you that. That's just a flat out lie. The second lie is a little bit more sneaky. By eating of the fruit, you will not die. Okay? 
the third, by eating the fruit, you will be like God. So here's the truth. The humans knew everything that was good. They didn't need to know the good part of the knowledge of good and evil. They knew good. The humans already had more than enough to eat. Everything was open to them. The humans already knew that eating the fruit would be defying God. The humans already... Now here's the basis of that third lie. Third lie, remember, was by eating the fruit you will be like God. The humans were already like God. They were reflecting God's image. They had God's image on them. They weren't God. The creation and the creator are two separate things. But they were like God in that they were reflecting God's image. The only thing eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would do is to bring about a knowledge of evil and bring death into their existence. Do you see where what God is trying to tell us through this? That when we sin, when we go against what God says, we're saying to God, I know better than you. I'm going to do it my way. And what does that bring? Death. Ultimately. It's something to make you sigh because we're all guilty. We're all guilty. I have one of my favorite Christmas sweaters that I wear is a picture of Santa Claus and underneath it says, you're all naughty. We're all naughty. The heart of sin is knowing what God desires from us and rejecting that for what we want, what is right in our own eyes. This is tough. This is tough. This is a reflection of who we are as humans. The humans decided to eat the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so they said, we're going to do it our way. We want it our way. And that doesn't go without consequence. So the first thing, first thing sin produces is guilt and shame. You see that in verses 7 and 10. Guilt and shame. And the distinctiveness of who they are as male and female now becomes relevant because they hid their nakedness. Before it didn't matter. Those distinctives were almost irrelevant to them. But now they're revealed and nakedness becomes shameful. Exposing yourself for who you are is shameful. Sin also produces a desire to shift blame. You see that in verses 12 through 13 where, um, you know, you know, Adam says, it ain't me, it's her. And the woman says, well, it wasn't me, it was the snake. So shifting blame, oh, it's never my fault, right? That, that comes into being. Sin produces a curse. And looking at this curse, you, you get an idea of who we are currently as humans. Before, before, the sin before the fall, you get an idea of who we were supposed to be as humans, what our purpose was, what we were designed to be. After the fall, this is who we are now. So first of all, the snake is cursed. Um, he's to crawl on his belly for the rest of his existence. That's humiliation. And it says, I will make enemies of you and the woman and your offspring and her descendant, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. We're going to come back to this in a second because this is really, really important. The humans are cursed. 
So the woman, labor, is bone. Traditionally, this has been interpreted as saying that the women, the woman will have intense pain when giving birth to children. Now, undoubtedly, that's true. That's totally true. Um, I have no idea what the pain was like for my wife when she gave birth to our son. But it, I knew it was intense. But I don't think that's what this verse is talking about. God didn't design a special curse on woman, women to experience pain when giving kids as a result of the fall. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's a part of it. But I think more to the heart of it is the word is bone for labor. It reflects more the labor or the pain in bringing up and raising children and having children who would inherit the sin nature. And that's what's going to cause her pain. So if you have kids, and for you women who have experienced childbirth, you know that that was painful. But if you have kids, when they start gaining their own will, and they start making mistakes, and doing the stupid stuff humans do, that can cause far more and far lasting pain than labor pains can. I'm not undermining that. I, I'm a guy. I'm a dude. What do I know about labor pains? Nothing. But I do know the pain that comes from when your children do things that are in a violation of God's nature of God's, I want to say God's laws, but who God designed us to be. You also notice that there's all of a sudden in inequality between man and woman. Inequality didn't exist in the garden. So this whole patriarchy thing came after sin. So those of you who think that men are above women, that's a result of sin. That's not a result of creation. Stew on that for a while. So inequality is a part of the curse of sin. Husband will rule over the wife. This is not God's desire, but it's how it is. And given her identity from the male, so she is named Eve, the mother of all nations. This is really hard because she's going to be the mother not only of Israel, but of Babylon as well. So, that is the woman's curse, the man's curse. These are the curses for women as well, but all of creation is cursed. Life will be spent in hard work. Again, that word is bone the same word used for woman's labor. Life is going to be hard and creation will work against them. Also death is now certain. The human being will die. He is being removed. The humans, man and woman, Adam and Eve are being removed from God's presence. Why? Because that's what they chose to do. They now have what's called death on them. Humans are banished from the presence of God. Sin has brought the stink of death into their lives. And when we get into Leviticus, we'll talk about what that means. Sin ultimately is a decreative force. Sin actively works to undo what God has done. Satan, the Hosatan, the snake, the dragon, whatever you want to call him, the devil, he is not God's enemy. He is the enemy of what God loves, and that's his creation. The Hosatan, the enemy, is the enemy of God's creation.
creation. He deeply desires to undo everything that God has done and return it to chaos. He wants to collapse the chaos waters. So this is kind of depressing, isn't it? It's who we are as humans. But out of this, two really important things emerge. First of all, from creation, God provides clothing for the man and the woman, a covering, protection. He promises protection over them. He isn't completely removing himself. But, but humanity has now removed themselves from his presence. But he's still going to be there in different ways now. So God is going to be providing a protection over them. And from the woman, let's go back to that. Let's go back to that verse. And I will make you enemies. He's cursing the snake now. I will make enemies of you and the woman and of your offspring and her descendants could that be? He will bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. So this is the other thing that comes out of the fall. God is going to provide a way back. At some point, there's going to be a savior and God is starting his restoration project right now, right at the fall. And he's saying to the woman, your descendant, some descendant of yours, is going to bruise the head of the enemy. But he's going to bite at the heel, meaning that he is a wounded healer. Sounds a lot like Jesus. And as Christians, we believe this is the first prophecy of the Messiah. God is starting his project to return humanity into his presence. And he is saying to the humans, there's going to be a way out. I'm going to provide a way out. They don't see it in their lifetimes. and take. In fact, it's going to take thousands of years before this comes to fruition. And it's going to be a while for us because we still have the rest of the Old Testament to get through. We've only hit three chapters. But next week we're going to take off. Next week, we're going to uh, start flying a little bit higher, and we're going to start looking at the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. And uh, I am looking forward to doing that with you. So this is Chaplain Greg with The Wandering Wesleyan going through our series, Walking in the Word. Again, if you really are enjoying these videos, please like, please subscribe, and uh, I will see you next week. God bless.